We come to this afternoon's session, which of course is going to build upon our first two sessions today. In our first study this morning, of course, we looked at the gradual regression of Lot as he took his family down to Sodom and the wheels fell off and it was an absolute disaster in the end. But, of course, we concluded with the cry that came up from Sodom. Clearly, as we saw, the cry of Lot, crying out for some kind of divine intervention in his life to save him from the circumstances into which he had got himself by bad choices. So we saw that, and we saw, of course, the the great need, brothers and sisters, to not do what Lot did. He ignored divine interventions in his life. And you and I, if we look back, we don't need to publicise this to anybody else, we can look back upon those moments in our life where we know there's absolutely no doubt in our mind that Yahweh has moved in our life. If that's happened in your life, I'll tell you something, he's not going to give up on you. Okay, But what he wants you to do is respond to those interventions, to make wise choices on the basis of The direction he's trying to point you, Lot, sadly, ignored them, and he went on his way. We want to talk a little little bit about that here today as well, of course. Move on to what you can see from this title on the screen behind me uh, is about the way that this world is behaving, and it's about to go down the gurgler, big time, okay? The gurgler of divine judgment, and it's coming. And sadly, brothers and sisters, it's touching us, the Christadelphian community. And I'll talk a bit about that. That's why, of course, uh, a lot of the younger folk have gone home. We've got the older folk and the young people here. I knew that would be the case. So that's why you're getting the session you're getting now. All right, and we're going to have a look at some interesting things along the way. I want you to come to Genesis chapter 14 with me again. Genesis chapter 14, of course, is about the battle of the kings, the invasion of a northern confederacy into the land of Canaan, attacking a southern confederacy, and there are four kings in that northern confederacy. You know the story pretty well. Some of you may have heard me talk about this before. This is the first place in our Bibles where we have Armageddon foreshadowed in a spectacular way. An unbelievably spectacular way. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work you through that. And then we're going to come to that scene at the end of the chapter where Abraham makes his solemn vow in the presence of Melchizedek and Lot is watching on. The divine intervention in his life didn't work for him. But it worked for Abraham, as we're going to see. So what have we got here in Genesis 14? As I said, it's very important things concerning the future For ourselves, we have the first cameo of the kingdom of God in the Bible. In verse 1, we have a northern confederacy forming. And if I was to read, let's just say I didn't like reading names in the Bible. And I'm going to substitute a few words. This is how I could read verse 1. Because I can't form the word Amraphel in my my mouth. I could read it this way, couldn't I? Because there are four kings mentioned here. And it came to pass in the days of these kings... Where have you heard those words before? Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. came to pass in the days of these kings that the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Okay, you know the words very well, don't you? Got about the big, the mountain, the stone that grows into a mountain and fills the whole earth. Well, I'm going to come back to those four kings in a moment. In verses 2 to 7, we have the northern confederacy invading the land. And of course, clearly foreshadows Gog's invasion of the land of Israel. In verses 8 to 12, we have a southern confederacy defeated. Lot and his family are taken captive. And we'll see what that represents in the scheme of things. In verses 13 to 16, Abraham is united with uh, Jew and Gentile. He puts together an army of Jew and Gentile. He defeats the invader and rescues Lot. In verses 17 to 20, Abraham meets Melchizedek, King of Salem, of course, clearly a type of Christ. And there's a fellowship meal of bread and wine, just like we had a little while ago here in this hall. In verses 21 to 24, Abraham repudiates the king of Sodom's offer of wealth because he's made an oath to Yahweh. 
So this is the first place in our Bibles we have a cameo of the kingdom and of course what precedes the kingdom are the events that lead to its establishment, the battle of Armageddon. It's all here in this chapter. So who are these characters and who do they represent? Well, the main characters are Kedalioma and his kings, Gog and his confederates. I'll come back to that in a minute. Lot, whose name means veiled, who in this type, Lot and his family represent Israel after the flesh in their blindness. You know what Paul says about the Jews? There's a veil upon their heart, 2 Corinthians 3. Okay, That's what Lot's name mean, means, veiled. The king of Sodom, of course, who represents the corrupt, effete and prosperous anti-Gog powers. Abraham and his servants represent Christ and the saints in warlike manifestation. And Melchizedek clearly represents Christ as king priest in the kingdom age. So here are our main characters. Now what we have here is this northern confederacy led by a man called Kidalioma. Now, I'm going to just, as I work through this, I'm going to just sort of take it gently for a while. I'm going to start putting a little bit of pressure on you to show you the pristine detail of this. It's unmistakable. But before I do that, there's one thing I'm going to do before I forget it. Why don't you have a look at verse 13 of Genesis 14. Verse 13, we read this. And there, is, and there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew. Now, that's all I want. It's the first occurrence in our Bible of the word Hebrew. I have a question for you. Where's the last? You can answer if you like. Where's the last? Yeah, Revelation 16, verse 16. The only time that you read the word Armageddon in the Bible. Okay? And what does it say in Revelation 16, verse 16? He brought them into a place called in the Hebrew tongue. Armageddon. Here's your divine imprimatur. Genesis 14 is about Armageddon. Okay? It's clearly about Armageddon. And I'll demonstrate that even more uh, fully as we proceed. Now, I want you to notice something at the beginning of Genesis chapter 14. We've got these four kings against five. Came to pass in the days of Amraphel. Amraphel means a powerful people. The king of Shinar. Shinar? What's that? What's the Hebrew form of the, of the Akkadian name Semiramis? Semiramis was the wife of Nimrod. Okay? So what do you reckon the kingdom is, is uh, this land of Shinar? Well, we know what. They built their town. They went to the land of Semiramis, Shinar, okay? And they built a tower. It became known as Babel, Babylon. Yes, yeah, so he's the king of Babylon. So who's the head of the image of Nebuchadnezzar? What's the head? Babylon. Yeah, that's why he's number one. Then you've got the next king referred to here, Ariok, king of Elisar. And then you've got Kedalioma, the king of Elam. Now, Kedalioma is the leader of this confederacy. Well, why is he number three, do you think? Wouldn't you put him at number one? Who leads the confederacy into the land of Israel? Go. Who's, whose thinking is behind all of this at the end of the day? Babylon, the great. All right? Yeah, so Babylon's your head. Kedalioma is the leader. He's number three in the list. That's not without purpose, as you'll see in a minute. His name just happens to mean a handful of sheaves. Interesting, isn't it? A handful of sheaves. He's destroyed in a valley, which just happens to be called Dan. A heap of sheaves in a valley for judgment. That's the meaning of the name Armageddon. So here we've got a very interesting type, clear type, of the events of Armageddon. There's no mistake in what God is trying to portray here. You know, let me just tell you why I'm talking about this. We are a hair's breadth away from Armageddon. We know from the signs of the times we are a hair's breadth away from Armageddon. What's Armageddon about? The destruction of the latter-day Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what it's about. And that's, brothers and sisters, your work and mine. So just bear that in mind as we proceed. I'm not wasting time here. 
talking about what's around the corner for you and me. So we've got this northern confederacy headed up by the man whose name is a handful of sheaves, in association with this powerful people, the king of Babylon, invades the land and takes Abraham's brethren captive, which is exactly what God's going to do. Zechariah 14, verse 2, he takes many captives. Okay? There's your name. Armageddon, heap of sheaves in the valley for judgment, precipitated by Gog. In the lines of Babylon the Great. So like King of Leoma, Gog is victorious and carries away many of the Jews into captivity. Lot represents them, along with the spoils of war. Got a bit of a picture? Now you know this pretty well, don't you? Everybody knows this one. This is Nebuchadnezzar's image, which has to stand up complete in the latter days. What have we got here? Babylon, gold. Medo-Persia, silver, Greece, brass. Roman Empire, iron. Four empires. There are four kings in Genesis 14, verse 1. And it's very similar, isn't it, to what we read in Daniel 2, 44. Four empires in the kingdom. So why is Kedalaoma, you think, the leader? Well, who's the leader of the invasion of the land in the latter days? Go. If you had to choose a metal for Gog, what would you choose? I know what I'd choose for Rome. That'd be iron, wouldn't it? Yeah. But I think I might choose brass for Gog. Now, why would I do that? I want you to come to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. And this is what we read about the fourth empire in verse 7 of Daniel 7. And this I saw in the night visions. Behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly, had great iron teeth. Now, we know this is a description of the Roman Empire. It's got iron teeth. What do you do with teeth? Well, you've just been practicing with your teeth downstairs. You chew on things. But how do you capture it before you chew it? What are you going to use to capture it before you chew it? Talking about animals, beasts here. Have a look at verse 19 of Daniel 7. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast. I've just been reading about that in verse 7 which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron, and his nails, or claws, that's what beasts capture their prey with, isn't it? Their claws. His claws are of brass. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yes, because even though Daniel chapter 7 is primarily about what happens in the West, And the little horn of verse 8, of course, is the Holy Roman Empire is telling us, giving us a clue. Yes. If I had to ask, what do you think the religion of Russia is today? You'd say, well, it's it's Russian Orthodox. Well, you're partly right. It is Russian Orthodox. But it was actually originally Greek Orthodox. Greek. That's why they want Constantinople back. That's their headquarters. That's why after the Turks shot down a, a Russian jet, on the 24th of November 2015, within two weeks, President Erdogan of Turkey had a letter on his desk demanding the return to the Russian Orthodox Church of the Hagia Sophia, which is like the Vatican, to the Greek Orthodox religion. Okay? Yeah. So it's brass, isn't it? That's why Kitalioma is number three in the list, because the third empire is the brazen empire. Now just turn a page to to Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. Look at verses 8 to 11. Now we know how this chapter starts. It starts with a a ram, two-horned ram. That's the Medo-Persian Empire. That's destroyed by a he-goat with a principal horn, Alexander the Great. We read this in verse 8. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, so Alexander dies, 32 years, 8 months old. Before it came up four notable ones, his empire within 20 years was split up into four parts toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came forth a little horn which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. That little horn is a reference to the Roman Empire in the east. 
It grew up out of one of the four horns, and that that horn was the was the kingdom of Pergamum. And in BC 138, the king of Pergamum, who didn't have any heir to the throne, bequeathed his kingdom. It's only small. He bequeathed his kingdom to the Roman Empire developing in the West. Yeah. So we've got here the little horn of the goat. As Brother Thomas points out, it's gone through iterations in history, but it doesn't matter. The little horn of the goat is the power occupying Constantinople. Of old, that was the Roman Empire in the East, wasn't it? Constantine moved the capital to Constantinople in 324 AD. 1453, the Turks come along and kick them out. The Greek Orthodox Church, the Eastern Church has to go to Moscow, and that's why you get the Russian Orthodox Church. Doesn't matter. The Turks constitute the little horn of the goat. But they won't have it for too much longer. Because Gog is going to take it as the king of the north. When they become the king of the north, by seizing the territory right across to Pakistan, they'll then take Constantinople. Okay? When they got that, the Russians become the little horn of the goat installed in Constantinople. Yeah, that's why Kidalioma is number three in the list. I said, it's pristine, isn't it? Absolutely pristine, the way the word of God is constructed. What we have here is this message about the future. Now, where does this end? Look at verses 19 to 25 of Daniel chapter 8. Now, this is where you get your explanation. Verse 90. He said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end. So it's going to take us right down to the latter days. The last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed the end shall be. Then he tells us the interpretation. The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. The rough goat is the king of Grecia, that's Alexander the Great. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now that being broken, wherefore, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. That's the Roman Empire. The most diverse language from the divine tongue of Hebrew just happens to be Latin. All right? Totally different language. Just happens to be Latin. Yeah, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people, which the Romans did, didn't they? AD 66 onwards. Yeah. And through his policy, also he shall cause craft, Brother Thomas says priestcraft, to prosper in his hand. He shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many, which is the policy of Vladimir Putin today. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, namely Christ, but he shall be broken without hand. So when Gog does finally take Constantinople, the next major event is their destruction on the mountains of Israel at the hand of Christ and the saint. That's Daniel chapter 8. That's all prefigured in Genesis chapter 14. Every detail of it. Genesis chapter 14. I want to move on from that now. I think that's probably enough on that. We should have come and have a look at the end of Genesis chapter 14 with me. And we sort of had a bit of a quick look at this this morning. We were pointing out that when this was happening, Lot was watching on. So we come to verse 20. Now let's just pick this up at verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought, out, brought forth bread of wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God, El Elyon. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And of course the greater blesses the lesser. So Melchizedek is superior to Abraham here. Blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. So Abraham pays tithes to Melchizedek. That's an acknowledgement that Melchizedek's greater. Clearly set forth as a type of Christ. 
And the king of Sodom comes up. He, he sort of waltzes up in verse 21. And as I said this morning, he said to Abraham, give me the persons, because that's what the world wants. They want our bodies. They want, they want to take us as captives, as slaves. You can have the stuff, but I'll have your body. Okay, Give me the persons, the bodies, and take the goods to thyself. And Abraham says, go jump in the lake. All right. Go jump in the lake. He said to him, I have lifted up mine hand unto Yahweh, the most high God, the possessor in heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread. And the word thread here is, is a reference to what girls would use to tie up their hair. You see them all over the floor of the ecclesial hall. Okay, You know those little bands they put around their hair? Yeah, all over the ecclesial hall. So what, what are they worth? We tread all, you know, tread all over them. Two, a shoe latcher. Yeah, it means a thong as tied, a sandal tongue. That's what it means. So you've got the hair and down on the foot. Not interested in anything. He repudiates him. Brother Carter, in the letter to the Hebrews, where he's commenting on Genesis 14, makes this, this observation about Abraham's oath in the presence of Melchizedek. And he says... It is clear from Abraham's words that in the worship of God, in company with Melchizedek, Abraham had made a solemn dedication of service to God. Some intimate words had passed between priest and worshipper, and some great resolve registered. The meeting had set Abraham's course and had given him the moral earnestness to follow it. Though it meant refusing the overtures of the king of Sodom, and offering a repulse to him that could make him an embittered enemy, which is why in chapter 15, verse 1, you read the words, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. He had reason to fear. There was a remnant to Kitaliomah's army that might return. He had just told the king of Sodom to jump in the lake. All right. He didn't take too kindly to that. He would have took umbrage to that. So Abraham had reason to fear. And God reassures him, I am thy shield. I'll look after you. And your exceeding great reward. Lot is watching on. Lot hears these words. Lot has a choice to go back to live with Abraham, or at least to live in the land. He could stay with Melchizedek. I think that wouldn't be a bad idea, would it? Why not stay with Melchizedek? In and around Jerusalem, or Salem as it was called. It's kingdom name, by the way. Yeah, no vision anymore. Jerusalem means the vision of peace. This vision is about the future. This is when it becomes peace. No vision anymore. Right? We know that from Psalm 76 verse 2. Yeah, Jerusalem's name in the kingdom age is Salem. Because it's not just going to be a vision of peace. Then it'll be the reality of peace. That's why we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So its name can be changed. Okay? So here is a wonderful vision of the kingdom. Lot heard all this. And he makes the wrong choice. Who, what donkey, what donkey would go back with the king of Sodom down to the place he came from? I mean, God has plucked you out of that. Come on. That's ridiculous. But you and I sometimes make such foolish decisions and choices. We see divine interventions, but don't recognize what God's trying to do. He, why do you think I'm emphasising this, brothers and sisters? I'll tell you why I'm emphasising it. The problem is in my own family. All right. That's how close to home it is. And I don't think there's too many of us are not touched in some way by this sort of thing. People see divine interventions and don't recognise it for what it is. If only, if only, we would respond. God could do something with our lives. But Lot makes foolish decisions. He goes back. Now I want to show you the times of Abraham, just briefly. Why did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, do you think? Because it was wicked? Yes. Well, why did he do it before? He could have done it earlier, couldn't he? No, he didn't. You know why he didn't? Because he didn't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah just because they were wicked. He did it to change Sarah's mind. 
That's what he did before. To change Sarah's mind. You know what I'm talking about? Well, let me explain. When you look at this series of chapters, you have something very fascinating. You've got Genesis 12, when Abraham is 75. He leaves Haran. Okay? You've got Genesis 13, which, of course, uh, uh, is, is the record uh, which, which sits between these, this very important chapter 14 and the one that follows at 15. Okay, so you've got 10 years of history laid out in 12, 13, 14, and 15. He's 85 in the events of Genesis chapter 15. In Genesis, this is 13, of course, it's about a lot, of parting, etc. Genesis 16 is one year later. Because we read, let me just show you this. End of chapter 16 of Genesis. Let's have a look at it. What does it tell us? Genesis 16, verse 16. And Abram was four score and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. He was 86. What's the next verse in your Bible say? He was 99. All right. In Genesis 17 verse 1, he's 99. Not a single word about Abraham's life or his family in 13 years. All right. Not a single word. But the next set of chapters, from 17 through to 21, okay, are all about one year. And you read that in Genesis chapter 17, and at verse 21 it says this, that my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. Set time means exactly 12 months away. Yeah, and the next chapter, the angels appear to Abram. Just a couple of weeks after his circumcision. Now he's still probably a bit troubled by that. Doesn't stop him running because he's desperate. He believes God that Isaac will be born within 12 months of the fifth visitation here in chapter 17 and the fifth promise. The problem is that Sarah doesn't share his conviction. She doesn't believe that she can bear a son to Abraham. We know that from chapter 18, don't we? So when you think about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, don't think it's just about the destruction of the wicked. It's not. It's actually about the redemption of the righteous, which is what Armageddon's about. It's not just about destroying the wicked brothers and sisters. It's about redeeming you and me. Let's illustrate that very quickly. Because when I have a look at what happens here, the invasion of Kedalaoma occurred when Abraham was 85, so that's when chapter 14 comes into the picture. Ishmael is born in 13 years of silence, five, when he's at Hebron. And then dramatically, these five chapters, Genesis 17 to 21, are exactly 12 months away. And it's in that period, in that 12 months, that Sodom is destroyed in order to bring Sarah up to speed of Abraham's faith. Now what happened? You know what happened? What happened was that when Sodom and Gomorrah was blown off the face of the earth, people who survived it were scattered all over the place. And just up the road at Hebron, there was this large encampment, very prosperous, a lot of animals, all sorts of things which hungry people saw as a Walmart. Okay? That was their Walmart. Except they weren't going to buy anything. They're going to pinch it with violence. So Abraham, who's been there for 20 years, has to flee. And he goes down to the land of the Philistines and comes to Jira. And you know what happened, don't you? Tells the lie again. So Sarah goes into the palace of, of Abimelech, king of the Philistines. And when she comes out, she comes out with the faith necessary to conceive Isaac. Now, it's a whole story in its own right, but that... That is why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Not because they were just wicked. He could have done it any time. It's because of Sarah. Wonderful things that God does for his servants. So let's have a very quick look at what happens here. Genesis 18, verses 1 and 2. You know, Paul says in Hebrews 13, verse 2, Be not forgetful to entertain, entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. That wasn't Abraham. 
but it was Lot. Lot didn't realise he was dealing with angels for a little while. And when the men outside the door were blinded and they reached out and grabbed him and pulled him in, he knew then. But until then, he just thought they were two men. He was even prepared to give away his daughters to protect them because that's what they did at them. That was their culture. If you had guests and you invited them in your house, there is no way that you're going to throw them out to the, to the wolves. No way. He'd even go to the extent of offering his own daughters. You and I wouldn't do that, would we? Okay. So let's read verses 1 and 2 of Genesis 18. And Yahweh appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre. Now, of course, as you know, the word there, plains, is, is the word alaun. It's the word for oak. It's the oaks of Mamre. And he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked. Now, why would he be doing this, brothers and sisters? Well, I'll tell you why he was doing it. He was waiting for the appearance of the angel again. You see, when you read what happened in chapter 17, you look at what it says in verse 22 of Genesis 17. He's just been told that in exactly 12 months, Isaac's going to be, be born. He knows that Sarah doesn't believe that. All right. He knows. Abraham believes it. Paul tells us that in Romans 4. But he knows that Sarah doesn't believe it. And how's he going to change all of this? He's desperate. So when it says in chapter 17, verse 22, and he left off talking with him, this is an angel whom he knows. I believe it's Michael the Archangel. I don't think there's any question about that. It's Michael the Archangel. He left off talking with him and God, Elohim, went up from Abraham. And he's desperate. He's waiting for him to come back. And in verses 1 and 2, Michael the Archangel comes back, but he's not alone. He's got two of his companions with him. Verse 2. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them. Look, people like Abraham, who's got a thousand people who's in Camden, have got servants everywhere. We know he had 312 in his house, right, training. He doesn't need to get up and run towards these angels. He can send a messenger out, can't he? But he doesn't. He runs. Why? Because he's waiting for the angel to come back to deal with Sarah. And so they do come back. We read in verse 3. He said, in the, in the King James, it says, My Lord, lowercase l-o-r-d, right? Wrong. This is one of the 134 occasions where the sophorim changed Yahweh into Adonai. If you bark them, you'll know this. He doesn't say, my Lord, he says, Yahweh, and it was Yahweh. Not in person, but in Michael the Archangel, his personal representative. This is why when you read what the angel says, have a look, for instance, at verse 10. He said, it says they said in verse 9, but in verse 10 it says he said, I so he uses the first person pronoun, right? This is Yahweh talk. When you look at verse 22 of chapter 18, at the end of the verse it says, the two angels went off to Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before Yahweh. Yeah, the personal representative of Yahweh, Michael the archangel, who's retired, by the way. Christ has taken over his role. Right? Well, he hasn't retired yet, but he's about to retire. So here is Michael the archangel. Abraham knows this angel very well. Speaks to him face to face. Okay. I mean, chapter 17 is the fifth time God has sent this angel to him. He knows him very well. And of course, the problem comes up, how to get Sarah up to speed. And Yahweh says, I'm not going to hide from Abraham what I'm going to do about this. I'm going to tell him what I'm going to do. I'm going to blow Sodom and Gomorrah off the face of the earth. And when that happens, Abraham's life is turned upside down. There's a divine intervention down to the land of the Philistines and the rest is history. Sarah comes up to speed. That all had to happen, brothers and sisters, in two and a half months. Right? Two and a half months that had to happen. You know what Paul says? All things are for your sakes. Do you believe that? All things 
are for your sakes. This proves it. Yeah. Everything God does is about the redemption of his people. He'll deal with the wicked as part of the process, but that's not his main concern. Main concern is your redemption and mine. And he's working on Sarah so that she can have Isaac so that you and I can end up being in Christ. Yeah, that's what he's working on. Who would go on to destroy Sodom? As we know from verse 22 and chapter 19, verse 1. I'm just going to uh, put up a few of these slides that in illustrate the difference between two households. You see, when you read the record of Genesis 18, in verse 6, we read this. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the heart. Who do you think would normally do that? Servants. And Abraham ran to the herd, he got a calf, and he came back and said to the young man, prepare that for me. Abraham and Sarah are working together to feed these angels. They know they're angels. At least Abraham does. When you come to the record of Genesis 19, what do you read? You have a look when these two men come into the house here. Where's Lot's wife? Isn't she, is she a bad cook or something? Where's she gone? I want to show you. Contrasting Christadelphian homes in these times. Sarah was quite content to dwell in tents. Anybody here content for that? Quite content to dwell in tents. Stranger and a pilgrim in the land. Lot's wife loved the materialism of Sodom. She didn't want to leave behind. Sarah laid with Abraham to show hospitality. Where was Lot's wife? Invisible. She was clearly present. You know that. She was present. She was in the house. Okay? We might entertain angels unawares. Sarah faithfully followed Abraham with us as we went. Lot's wife reluctantly left Sodom even under angelic compulsion. They had her by the hand. Okay. Sarah called Abraham Lord in her heart even when he let her down. Lot's wife left her heart in Sodom and turned back from behind Lot. Sarah trusted God when forsaken by her husband. Lot's wife trusted in uncertain riches when her husband was with her. Sarah was subject to her husband even when he failed to honour the weaker vessel. Lot's wife was independent when Lot's presence was vital to her survival. Contrasting Christadelphian homes. Sarah had her prayers heard by God and was delivered because her husband couldn't do it. Lot's wife was prayerless in the hour of need and was forsaken. Sarah is the well from whence we are digged, says Isaiah 51 and verse 1 and 2. Lot's wife became a solitary and sterile pillar of salt. Pretty sharp contrast, isn't it? So what do you reckon about that, brothers and sisters? What message does that have for you and me in 2018, you reckon? I'll let you work that one out. I want just speak a word about women's liberation and what it's done to our society. Its impact upon our society. 1975 was the watershed year, wasn't it? International Women's Year. Since then, women have sought and largely gained government-sponsored affirmative action programs. I used to be in government recruitment. I know a bit about that. Okay. The right to have their own career unhindered by family commitments... Equality with men in the workplace, equal employment opportunity, equal pay and promotional opportunities, breaking down the grass ceiling, as they call it. Government and employer subsidised childcare facilities. So the building I worked in had a creche upstairs. Now, so you can bring along your young kids and let someone else look after them. Equality in the church, even to the priesthood and the ministry. I don't know whether this church that we're standing in, now in Ecclesial Hall, had a female pastor, but I wouldn't be surprised at all. Some of the consequences, disappearance of traditional family life, rapidly increasing rate of divorce and remarriage. Two and three marriages now fail. Okay, two and three marriages fail. Growing number of de facto marriages, so why bother getting married? Emergence of step families through remarriage. You know where my kids, uh, my grandkids go to school? 35% of the children. 35% of the children in that school 
live in homes where at least one, if not two, of the adults in the home are not their natural parent. Okay? That's what's happening to society. Dramatic growth of dining out for evening meals and men forced to accept domestic duties. Now, don't get, don't get me wrong, brothers and sisters, when my children, when I had our first child, and, and I did it later on as well, I was quite prepared to change what we call nappies in Australia. You call them diapers here. Okay? I had no problem with that. But my wife would never let me take over household duties to the exclusion of what she wanted me to do. She wanted me to keep my head in the Bible so I could give spiritual leadership to her and her children. Okay? And to go out and earn a living so that she didn't have to go and earn a living. That's what she wanted me to do. Yeah, but it's all changed, hasn't it? So, what about this lady, Lot's wife? Come back to Genesis 19 with me. Verse 26. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. You know, it says in the King James, but. The literal translations have got and. She turned back at the moment of Sodom's destruction, described in verses 23 and 24. That's what precedes it. So when the boom came, she couldn't resist it. Because what she loved and what she wanted to preserve had just been blown sky high. And she had daughters back there too. Didn't come out. No. Yeah. Real sad, very sad. She looked back in the Hebrew, in the back, the scan. This is not sort of, oh, shouldn't have done that. This is looking back, scanning. And all she can see is fire and brimstone. Okay. Scanning intently. That's what that word means. The only literal says, look expectantly. Yeah. She had children back there, and I, I feel for her in that regard. Terrible, isn't it? But really, we know from Luke 17, as we saw in our exhortation, we know what the real motivation for looking back was and scanning. We know what it was, don't we? Yeah, materialism. The loss of that way of life. From behind him, it says in the record. Did you see that? She looked back from behind him. He couldn't help her. Because he couldn't look back, could he? She's behind him. Better off to have your family out in front, as it were. And she became a pillar, something stationary, the Hebrew word means. She used nine times of military garrisons, twice of officers, and only once of a statue. And she's the one. A pillar of salt. It's the second occurrence of the word salt in the Hebrew. It's a symbol in the, in the word of God for permanence. She became one with the region she loved. Sad story, isn't it? Now, look, I, I was a little reluctant to put up this couple of, of slides because I, you know, I knew I'd touch you know, some sore uh, uh, points here. Uh, but I'm courageous enough to, to do that. Let's, let's hope it works out. Bear in mind that there are always exceptions to every rule. Okay? I have a daughter who's forced to go out to earn a living because her husband doesn't provide for the family. Simple as that. So there are, there are circumstances where you can't. You can't avoid it. Okay? So don't, don't take this the wrong way. This is, this is about priorities at the end of the age. We've got to take some of these lessons for ourselves. We've got to see what's happening. We've got to recognise divine interventions. If we don't and we get to the end and it can't be too far away, we've only got ourselves to blame. Sarah-like qualities. I'm not suggesting this you read on the screen is, can be matched for Sarah and Lot's wife. They're Sarah-like qualities and they're Lot's wife-like qualities related to the latter days. Sarah, full support the husband in the work of the truth, is priority to duties at home and in the ecclesia. Lot's wife, too full of her own interests and pursuit for the other, or willing to support husband in the work of the truth. Sarah-like qualities, given to hospitality and care of the family, concern for the sick and the aged, the fatherless and the widows. Lot's wife, she's too preoccupied or tired from career-related activities to be concerned for anyone. Okay? 
Content with food, with Sarah and Rhema, an adequate shelter, that's all she wanted in life. She'd learned that the world has nothing to offer. Lot's wife, like Paul, is never satisfied with the status quo, always looking to try some new experience, taste or fashion. Sarah, like Paul, is happy with the same circumstances of life for over 50 years. The place she lives in is incidental to its primary purpose. Lot's wife, like Paul, is she was never settled, always looking to augment and upgrade the earthly possessions that she prized, even at the expense of normal domestic duties. She wasn't there. She's in the house, but she was not there to do domestic duties when the angels arrived. That's the difference. Sarah, like colonies, devoted to the raising of her God-given children, teams God's heritage until they leave home. Lots like colonies, prepared to give the care of her children to others in order to pursue career and financial security. Sarah White Quality is a faithful and submissive partner even when not given proper consideration by an imperfect husband. You got any perfect husbands in this hall, do you think? I'm looking at a few. But I don't think they'll put their hand up. Lots of White Qualities. A self-interested and independent partner, ready to demand more than is right in order to pursue her own personal objectives. Got a picture? Well, that's why we read 2 Peter chapter 2. Let's come to 2 Peter chapter 2. This is 6 and 7. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. They were condemned. Katakrino. To judge against. Pass sentence against. This word overthrow in this verse happens to be catastrophe. Yeah, we use this word with a C instead of a K in our English language, don't we? An overturn, a demolition. An ensample, an exhibit for warning. It's almost like God, because he's got the scriptural record, has said, now listen here, you folk. Look at Genesis 19. (coughs) That's my exhibit. This is what happens to people who act like this. But afterwards, should, that is, the word of the Greek means intend to do, they intend to go about this way of life, It's a warning to them. Look at verse 7. He delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. The word delivered here means to draw or snatch from danger for oneself. You notice, for oneself, that's because the Greek word is in the middle voice. The middle voice is an action you do to or for yourself. So here's God snatching Lot, like he's going to snatch you and me shortly. Snatching Lot out of this terrible situation. What's he doing it for? You? No. He's doing it for himself. Ah. That's what he's doing it for. Comes on to say, just law, that which is right, a right state, who vexed his righteous soul, we read. Okay. Vexed with the filthy conversation, the wicked. Now this word vexed here is kataponio, to wear down by hard labour. You only find that word in one other place, Acts 7.24. The filthy, the lascivious, wanton behaviour or behaviour or conduct of the lawless. That's what what they are. The lawless. Verse 8 says, For that righteous man, the word there, dikaios, as you can see, is the same as that word just in verse 7. He delivered a righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing. He was dwelling. He'd settled down. It means to reside in that place. He couldn't see a way clear of it. It goes on to say in verse 8, he vexed his righteous soul. This is a different word. Rendered the same in the English. It's a different Greek word. As an iso, it means to examine and then to torture and to inflict pain. You think about that. He's looking, he's seeing and hearing. He knows the impact upon himself. I don't know about you, brothers and sisters. 
But when I come across the sort of things that people are doing in the world, it can stir up my base instincts. Hmm. See? And then you say to yourself, I don't like this at all. Okay? You begin to torture yourself if the truth at work. Yeah, you're torturing yourself, aren't you? Yeah, it's that experience of law. And when we read in verse 9, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations, it says. You can cross the S off. It's only singular, temptation. He knows how to deliver. Here is our word. Huh? This happens to be the middle voice too. To draw or snatch from danger for oneself. Temptations, singular, putting to the proof. In other words, the trials and the temptations we go through in life where we're put to the proof. God knows how to deliver you. You know the best method? When you're in that situation, it's very hard to do it when you're in that situation, particularly if your flesh is taken over. Pray. As the brethren in that book wrote, prayer and evil cannot live together. If one is present, the other must die. Prayer and evil cannot live together. It's the antidote for the days of law. We were in Tel Aviv 2015 in April. The banners were still up in Tel Aviv, which is now the homosexual capital of Europe. And Benjamin Netanyahu got up in the UN in September 2016 and boasted about it. He boasted about Israel's liberal society. The fact that people were coming from all over the world, especially from Europe, for these festivals. How dare they use the rainbow? You know what it says about the rainbow? Where are you in your Bible? Peter, come to Genesis chapter 9. In Genesis chapter 9, we have God giving the sign that he's not going to send a flood to destroy all the earth again. This is what he says about it. Verse 14. It shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow, the bow shall be seen in the cloud. Now, why is the bow there? Do you like rainbows? I love rainbows. It's one of the most spectacular thing God ever made, isn't it? But he didn't put it there for you. It's not there for you. Read the next verse. Verse 15. And I will remember my covenant. Look at verse 16. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it. That I might, not for you, brothers and sisters, it's for God. How dare they use the rainbow? And how dare Christadelphians put the rainbow flag on their Facebook accounts because they support homosexuals? How dare they? Little wonder that God's judgments are waking. Little wonder. This is what the Bible says about that practice. Romans 1, 26, 27. Do I need to read it? I don't need to read it, do I? Vile affections. That which is against nature. Turning a natural use. Right? Into an unnatural use. Men with me. Working that which is unseemly. Okay? And what we have is a problem because in Romans 1, verse 32, he says this Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. There are Christadelphians that use the rainbow on their Facebook page as a mark of support for homosexuals. And, though you can't get into it now, unless you've got the password, 
there's also a Christadelphian homosexual website. Well, they say they're not Christadelphians, but they began as Christadelphians. Yeah. And I know, and you know, cases where this is happening in our brotherhood. What are we going to do about that? Well, it's never any different, has it? Isaiah 1 verse 10, you know what that says? Hear the word of Yahweh, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. Who's he talking to? Well, he tells us who he's talking to. In verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for Yahweh hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. He's talking to his own people, Israel. Jeremiah 23, verse 14. I have seen this also in the prophets of Jerusalem. An horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers that none doth return from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. Wouldn't it be an awful thing if the divine judgment was that mob Oh, like Sodom and Gomorrah. We've got to be very, very careful as to where we go, brothers and sisters, in these matters. What are the lessons we take away from today? Pretty simple, isn't it? Very simple. Never ignore divine interventions. As the world gets worse, and it will get worse, no question, whatever time is left, it'll get worse, and so it will be in our community. Okay? You know that from history. Prayer is going to be an essential thing in our lives, brothers and sisters. And we need to pray after the pattern of that widow woman. All right? Crying day and night to be rescued. I can't wait for the return of Christ. I've got 12 grandchildren. The oldest just got baptised. Isn't that amazing? The oldest just got baptised. But the youngest is still three years of age. I don't want them to go through schooling. I want them to be removed and taken to Sinai. So that grandma and grandpa can see their kids, their grandkids, in the kingdom of God as mortal. That's what I want. There's not a day. I'm not going to give God any peace, and neither will you. I'm not going to give God any peace until he sends his son to rescue us.